This podcast episode was made possible in part with support from Sacred Rights, a Henry Luce Foundation-funded project hosted by Northeastern University that promotes public scholarship on religion. I highly recommend you learn more about Sacred Rights on their website, sacred-rights.org, that's W-R-I-T-E-S, or find Sacred Rights on Twitter at sacred underscore rights. Welcome to Classical Ideas. This is Greg Soden. Knowledge about indigenous lands and sacred sites are issues I have struggled with my entire life, and I'm certain I'm not alone in my personal lack of such knowledge. That said, I would like to start this episode by acknowledging the sovereignty of the Seneca Nation. It is on their land where I'm currently situated and where the majority of the work for this podcast takes place. The Seneca, along with the Mohawk, Cayuga, Onondaga, Oneida, and Tuscarora, make up the six nations of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the world's oldest continuous democracy. The ground upon which we walk is something that should not be taken for granted as part of our everyday lives. Every land has a history, and histories of violence, resistance, and survival linger long after events have transpired. These are ideas I carry with me, and on this episode, I will talk with someone else who has explored the history of indigenous lands and the meaning of indigenous sacred sites. My guest on this episode is Abel Gomez. Gomez is a PhD candidate in the Religion Department and earned a Certificate of Advanced Studies from the Women's and Gender Studies Department at Syracuse University. His research focuses on sacred sites, ritual, and decolonization in the context of contemporary indigenous religions. Abel is currently completing his dissertation, an ethnography of sacred sites protection movements among the Ohlone peoples of the San Francisco and Monterey regions in California. He is a steering committee member for the Native Traditions in the Americas unit of the American Academy of Religion and recently served on the committee organizing the annual Bay Area American Indian Two Spirits powwow in San Francisco. In our conversation, we discuss his dissertation, Sacred Sites, Ceremony, and Belonging in Ohlone Territory, a case study of indigenous survival, the Spanish colonial history of California, the mission system, Junipero Serra, and the conversions, terror, and trauma of indigenous people in the region. You can follow Abel on Twitter at Jaratura, that's J-A-R-A-T-U-R-A. So without further delay, please enjoy my conversation with Abel Gomez. Abel Gomez, welcome to Classical Ideas. Thanks so much for having me. It is a real delight to have you here for one of my special Sacred Rights cohort episodes in this series that I'm doing. Um, I'm wondering if you can just start off by introducing yourself a little bit to the audience so they can know a little bit about who you are and what you do. My name is Abel Gomez, and I am a PhD candidate in the Religion Department at Syracuse University where I also did a certificate of advanced studies in women's and gender studies. And today I'm speaking to you from within the traditional territory of the Ramaytush Ohlone peoples. This is the place that my family originally migrated to from Nicaragua and El Salvador on my mom's side and Mexico on my dad's side. And it's also where I was born and raised. Fabulous. So you're essentially at home now after spending several years out in the world, like at different graduate institutions. That's, is that right? That's right. Wonderful. Well, I want to talk a little bit about that, the academic path that you have gone on. So tell me a little bit about some of your, um, some of your interests start off. What are you most interested in as a scholar? And then we'll kind of go backwards and trace those, that those stepping stones. My research looks primarily at contemporary indigenous religions and more particularly at issues around sacred sites protection and cultural revitalization movements that allow native peoples to reclaim relationships to their traditional territories. But on a broader level, I'm really interested in how religion, 
offers this important set of resources for communities that have been marginalized, displaced, colonized, how it allows folks to maintain a sense of humanity and navigate the world in the wake of various kinds of ruptures. Mm, excellent. I want to know about this path too. Um, some of the stepping stones on your academic journey that you have traveled until this point that you are now at today talking to me. So what are some of your major academic uh, turning points that you've experienced and the institutions that you've gone to? So like a lot of people that I know, my undergraduate years were very formative for me academically and politically. During that time, I got involved in a eco-feminist community of witches. And awesome. there was a lot of conversation about the relationship between spirituality, social justice, gender, sexuality, and the ways that religion can be this catalyst for social change. I was also working on my undergraduate degree at San Francisco State University in philosophy and religion and was plugged into a lot of different organizations, queer organizations, Latinx organizations. And we had lots of discussions about women of color feminism, colonialism, community activism. And along that trajectory in those communities, I was invited to this place called Indian Canyon which is the only federally recognized Indian country, is the legal term, the only federally recognized Indian country for 350 miles between Sonoma and Santa Barbara. And Indian Canyon is stewarded by Anne-Marie Sayers, the tribal chairwoman of the Indian Canyon Mutsin Band of Ohlone people. And that was really the first time that I met an Ohlone person, as far as I was aware. And so I started thinking like, what does it mean to be doing all of this political work and asking all these questions on colonized land, on indigenous land? And so the, the trajectory has been, who are these people? Uh, what is their history? Uh, to now, what is my responsibility as someone living within their territory? And that's kind of where my dissertation is right now. Mm. When you were at, interesting that you said San Francisco State, one of my students' favorite audio recordings is of the Bhagavad Gita recorded by Jacob Needleman, who I believe is at San Francisco State as well in philosophy. Um, interesting. So you did all that. You had those experiences in your undergraduate years in San Francisco. Where does the, the, the path take you next when you realized your interest was so specific and uh, sort of like identified almost pretty early on, it sounds like? So I did my master's at University of Missouri, Mizzou. Initially, my thought was that I was going to do a comparative project looking at the relationship between contemporary neo-pagan religions and Native American religions. And I was taking a class, or I was preparing to take a class with Elaine Lawless, this amazing feminist folklorist. She was offering a class on women's folklore and feminist theory. And I was going back to the Bay Area for the suburbs, right, to see my family. And I thought, well, there are a lot of women in the broader Ohlone community that are doing a lot of really amazing political work and work around cultural revitalization. I wonder if I could do some of the field work for this upcoming class. And that will be the data that I use for the final paper. So I interviewed several women and I got to thinking maybe this actually ought to be my project. So I ended up looking at, for my MA thesis at the University of Missouri, the relationship between land and cultural revitalization as it relates to ceremony, which then took me to Syracuse University where I did my coursework and exams and working on my dissertation to really look at how relationship to land, protection of sacred sites is a pivotal component in how indigenous communities are 
imagining futures, how they're envisioning decolonial futures for themselves. And mm. that was then shaped by conversations around globalization and how colonization is also gendered. And, and what does it mean that we all live here together? I love it. Well, what's something that's really interesting to me as well is the way that higher ec- ha- uh, the way that higher education works is we oftentimes are find ourselves in institutions that are far removed from where our research focus is. And I know that uh, the the topics and the people that you're interested in are mostly the Ohlone from the Monterey, San Francisco Bay area, but you found yourself in Missouri and Syracuse. What were some of the challenges that you navigated as you were finding your niche as a as a, a writer and as a researcher with in communities, but finding yourself far away? What were some of those challenges like? In some ways, not being able to be on the ground and go to protests and ceremonies and events. And at the same time, I was still able to be plugged in through social media, which was really great. And in other ways, it's not that unusual. There are people at all these universities that study Asia and Africa in the US. That's a really good point, yeah. The other thing that I would say that was really important is at Syracuse University, I was living so close to the Onondaga Nation, the central fire of the Haudenosaunee, which offered such a different model of what indigeneity looks like. At Onondaga, they still practice the traditional longhouse form of government. They still have the matriarchs, the clan mothers, decide the chiefs. Yeah. Very different than what I was used to. Well, I I live in Buffalo, so I went to the Ganondagan site uh, this summer, which was tremendous. And so I'm still actually exploring everything that's in my sort of new backyard, because as you know, I was in Missouri as well. And now I found myself in Western New York. So there's this fantastic new history uh, that I've been learning about since I've been living here, which I'm sure was just equally ex- as exciting for you as well while you were over here. Um. I'm curious as well about your time at Mizzou, a place that is near and dear to me and to you. And I was a Columbia Public School teacher of religious studies and English at Battle High School, um, just on the outskirts of town. And a bunch of my best friends teach at Hickman and Rockbridge. You know, and I've studied and worked and taught at Mizzou, and it's just sort of ingrained in my identity. Um, what was? Tell me a little about your your time at Mizzou. Who did you work with that you really enjoyed? I was really lucky that I got to work with Dr. Dennis Kelly, who I know is on your show. He asks a lot of the central questions that I'm interested in about identity, ceremony, place. And so working with him has been very pivotal to how I approach a lot of these issues. And as I mentioned earlier, I also got to work with Dr. Elaine Lawless and got to think about how to do ethnography in a particular way rooted in a folklore perspective as well as a feminist theory perspective. Nice. Is that, is that your main method of, of research and work is ethnography? That's right. I'm an ethnographer. So I gone to protest ceremonies, cultural events, and especially interviews with folks. And I will say that the work of building those relationships has probably been the most exciting, most fulfilling part of this entire research experience. Spectacular. Well, and after all of these experiences that you've had the last several years, you find yourself sitting here talking to me, a current member of the 2020 Sacred Rights Cohort of Scholars. And you know, I'm talking to every cohort member, and I always love my conversations with sacred rights scholars. Some of the work that everybody in the cohort does just continually inspires me to keep learning forever. Um, And it's just why this show never, you know, bores me, you know, there's constantly brand new things to learn. And I'm curious about your perspective on sacred rights as well, after having gone through the program and the trainings and starting to put out work into the world as a member of the cohort. Tell me why you applied to this fellowship and what sorts of skills you feel you are adding to your scholarship toolbox. It seems as if most people in the United States know virtually nothing about indigenous peoples. 
much less issues connected to the protection of sacred places. I think that the movement to resist to the, the Dakota Access Pipeline probably shifted some of that, but there's still so much that people don't understand. And even in the Bay Area, I have conversations with people and they don't even know that native people are still here. I also think about some of the conversations that I've had with native elders. There was a trip that I went to uh, to Buffalo to learn about how to talk about and teach about colonialism. And on the way there, I was having a conversation with one of the matriarchs at Onondaga. And she was saying that most people don't understand that knowledge is also about responsibility, that we have responsibility to the things that we know. And as I've had conversations with Ohlone folks in the Bay Area, this is also something that has come up. They have said, now that you know our stories, now that you know that we're still here, it's your responsibility to share that information with other people. And I think that this is important regardless of what your background is or who your ancestors are. One of the things that uh, Dr. Dennis Kelly talked about is that Native American history is actually history for everybody. Uh, if we live here, we have a responsibility to understand the history, but also to understand what is happening in the contemporary world. Issues impacting land and water impact all of us. And certainly in this moment where the country is really reckoning with histories of racism and colonialism, we can't actually reckon with those if we don't learn about acknowledge and start having the really difficult conversations around how we got to this point. So I was really excited to be part of the cohort to be able to add to the conversations that folks are having and to be able to have those conversations in a way that is accessible, in a way that is bringing to light these issues. So things like how to pitch an article to a news source, yeah. how to, right? write an op-ed and write an explainer. Things like working with media, working with social media have all been super, super helpful. And also then getting me to think as an educator, how can I be even more effective in the classroom to approach students where they are? Amazing. Well, I want to dive into some of your work because I have so many questions and I want to talk starting with your, your dissertation a little bit. Um, I found the title is Sacred Sites, Ceremony, and Belonging in Ohlone Territory, a Case Study of Indigenous Survival, Focusing on San Francisco, Monterey Regions. So you mentioned the lack of understanding about uh, the, the presence of the Ohlone within California. Maybe just tell everybody a little bit about um, who this population of uh, folks are, um, where their, you know, their, their main territories and ancestral homes are, and you know a little bit more about about what we should know. Ohlone is a contemporary term that refers to the indigenous peoples whose territory includes the San Francisco Peninsula and the East Bay, so Oakland, Berkeley, along the coast to Monterey and Big Sur. But to be a bit more specific, uh, Ohlone actually refers to languages, so a group of eight related languages that anthropologists have kind of lumped together and called them Costanoan. But at the time of European contact in the late 18th century, there were over 50 distinct local tribes. And today's Ohlone peoples also remain distinct. They are the survivors of the Spanish mission system, the Mexican Rancho period, and then following the gold rush, literal genocide. And throughout that, they are still very much alive. They're still very much here. There are a number of distinct revitalized tribal governments, organizations, family lineages that maintain relationship to their particular ancestral territory. They're working to bring back 
language and songs, traditional foods, ecological knowledge, sovereignty over their homelands, and the protection of cultural and religious sites for the generations to come. Excellent. What do you think it was about learning about the Ohlone that that grasped you so much? Like, what was it about, um, you know, this that this topic that you that you work with, which is so like old at this point and so a part of where you personally come from? What was it about this particular topic that just really dragged you in and uh, didn't let go? For folks that grew up in California. In fourth grade, we have the missions unit where we have to learn about the missions and you know how great the missions were. And we have to create a diorama of a mission. And I did Mission Dolores in San Francisco. And so there were these conversations about the Ohlone people, but always in the past tense. And as I mentioned, as an undergraduate, thinking about like, what does it mean to live on this land? And what are the histories of this place? So thinking a lot about what is my relationship to all of these histories? What is my relationship to the land that I live on, the people that are still here? And this continues to fuel my inquiry into these issues. How much a part of the social conversation in the Bay Area are the Ohlone people? Like, Is this something that's completely overlooked in the region now? I mean, because it seems like so much of the area are transplants, people from outside California um, who go there for any number of reasons. How how overlooked is this is this information and this history? It is shifting pretty rapidly. And part of that has to do, I think, with on the one hand, movements like the resistance to the Dakota Access Pipeline. And on the other hand, this movement across the country around land acknowledgements. So land acknowledgements are becoming now institutionalized. And so this is shifting the conversation, but also the ways that local tribes have been putting in so much work to educate people and to build coalitions and relationships with academic institutions, with park districts. And so all of this is really shifting the conversation in a pretty big way. So people at least know now that Ohlone people are still here. Excellent. Um, you have you have several pieces of recent scholarship out that I was absolutely in love with while I was reading. And you have... Um, an article called Statues Topple and a Catholic Church Burns as California Grapples with its Spanish Colonial Past. And as somebody who grew up in the Midwest, I'm a St. Louis and Missourian born and raised. And so this is all very new to me. And I love learning about how um, how rich uh, the, the history of this country is, how disturbing, how rich, how beautiful, how horrifying, the whole gamut of our of the history of this country that we live in. Um, you know, the news of a toppled, vandalized, and removed statues, like many to do with like the Civil War, slave buying and selling, or Columbus, like it's been huge news in the past couple of years. Like here in Buffalo over the summer, uh, Col- the Columbus Park um, statue was vandalized several times, and it was taken down and and removed. Um, so this is something that's going on all across the country. And a recent piece of yours in the in the conversation has a religious element as well. And I'm wondering if you can tell me a little bit about what you began seeing in California in the summer of 2020 in the wake of the now um, very wide widely reported George Floyd uh, murder protests. I think it's important to contextualize this really in the aftermath of the work of Black Lives Matter and allies, which I just think have done such an incredible amount of work in ensuring that issues around white supremacy are on the minds and the hearts of people across this country. It seems as if every generation we have to revisit the fact that Yes, there is racism. Yes, there is colonialism. And often it's 
as a result of various kinds of violence on the bodies of Black people and Native people and other marginalized folks. So while statues were being removed across the country for monuments to Confederate leaders and slave owners, in California, the conversation was around Junipero Serra and the removal of statues in LA, in San Francisco, really as a response to this broader conversation and as a response to how here we reckon with histories of white supremacy and racism. And even as recently as this past Indigenous Peoples Day, there was a statue that was removed at Mission San Rafael Arcangel in Sonoma County, which is Coast Miwok territory by five indigenous activists. And all of this is really a critique of the ongoing impacts of Spanish colonialism. And it's become so, so much a part of how we experience the world that probably people don't even think about it. Like all of the place names here are named after Spanish saints. It's literally our geography, San Francisco, right? That's not the indigenous name. This is the territory of the Alamu. I'm in the, near the village site of Chuchui. All of these place names are colonial place names. Mm. And so how we think about how did that come to be? And how does that live out in the lives of indigenous peoples? I think that this is some of the response. Mm, I love it. You just said several really important things, but it's like, do, do we understand how things came to be called, what they're called? Do we think about that as we walk down our paved streets every day? And do we question the, um, you know, something like San Francisco as being, you know, obviously of Spanish origin? And do you, do we think about who was here before this Spanish origin took root? It's a really important question for the ways that people can live their lives on a day-to-day basis, walking around, continuously questioning what we walk on every single day and why we see printed on the sides of signs and buildings and streets and street directionals, what we see. It's, uh, it's a really amazing method that you can use every single day to reorient the way that you see the world. And it's quite powerful if you've never taken the time to do that. You know, I love it. So you just said a bunch. First of all, who is Junipero Serra for anybody out there who doesn't know that name, which is so renowned if you're from California? Junipero Serra was a theologian and a missionary, and he is best known for being the founding figure of the California mission system. And this mission system, which started in 1769 in what's now called California, is in reality an expansion of the already extensive mission system in Mexico in the Southwest And in 1769, he journeyed into what's now California in what was called the Sacred Expedition to, on the one hand, colonize California to secure land for Spain, and two, to convert indigenous peoples and transform them into Spanish Catholic subjects who would labor for the benefit of the empire. Mm. And so this meant that native peoples entered into the missions, they were baptized, but once you were baptized, you could not leave unless you had permission. And so this created a life of very intense trauma, terror, crisis for people who had to attend religious services, who had to engage in manual labor and failure to do so would result in being whipped. It meant the radical transformation of their landscape through cattle ranching and also the rise of various kinds of epidemics as a result of European diseases. And so little by little, 
even tribes that were not in the missions essentially had no choice but to enter into the missions as their, their worlds were completely transformed. As people entered into the missions and the lands were shifted, we saw the, the ending of economic systems, of trade, of ceremonial systems. So in some ways, this really was the end of the world for native people in this part of the world. Deborah Miranda, who is a literary scholar from the Ohlone Costanoan Esalen Nation, she describes this period as the end of the world. And indeed, within the span of 65 years, the 85,000 native people that went into the mission system was down to about 15,000 in 65 mm. years. There are some scholars who say, well, we need to really account for the amount of agency that native people had, perhaps conversion in some ways allowed them to maintain a level of cultural practice, which I think has some merit and communities were, were devastated by this. I don't think there's any way to, to argue against that. So some of this controversy is around the fact that this man was the founding figure in this in this mission system mm. you know when i used to live in canada um and i still live very close to canada so the history of christian boarding schools and canadian boarding schools to commit cultural genocide on first nations people is something that i've been exposed to and you know sought to learn about quite a lot but it really wasn't until i was living in saskatoon when i was like 26 years old that I started exploring this. So by the time I discovered that these things had happened, I was like an adult years behind essentially. Um, but I've never lived in California and I have no exposure to like the history of Spanish colonialism in the U S as far as who was impacted. So these questions of cultural erasure, these questions of genocide, it, it's, it's super important for people like me who, who want to know about these things, but just for whatever reason, wasn't exposed to it because of where I happen to live in the country. And, you know, I'm curious about the scope of the Spanish colonial past and, you know, like how many groups, how many tribes, how many, uh, you know, how many populations of people were impacted by this Spanish colonial system and this mission system across the West uh, during the course of its, um, you know, during the course of its life in that in the system. This was particularly, at least in the context of California, the folks from about present day Sonoma, so coast Miwok territory, down into San Diego, so Kumeyaay territory. And one of the impacts of this in regards to the cultural erasure that happened and cultural destruction that happened is that virtually no tribe within that span along the California coast has federal recognition, mm. which means that they don't have nation to nation agreements with the federal government, which means they don't have access to American Indian health services, which means they don't have access to reservations. I mean, the one, the one exception in Ohlone territory is this place I mentioned, Indian Canyon. But part of what happened is that the mission system totally disrupted cultural continuity. And certainly there are ways in which people have worked to revitalize those, but it's very different than colonialism in other parts of the country or other parts of the world. Mm, so the experience of the Ohlone in California looks looks a little different about how it was managed to progress compared to like what what goes on here in New York, where maybe those groups weren't quite as um, you know interrupted. Does that make sense? Is that an interesting comparison? Exactly, and part of that is that Ohlone and other California Indian people went through three waves of colonialism. Mm. Spanish missionization, the Mexican period, and the American period. And as I think I mentioned earlier, with statehood in California, 
came a literal genocide Mm -hmm. where state and federal governments paid something like $1.7 million to eradicate California Indians. Benjamin Madley, who's a historian at UCLA, wrote a book called An American Genocide, using the United Nations definition of genocide and applying that to what happened in California. Do you know any of the statistics of that genocide, like what the casualty rates were or anything like that off the top of your head? I believe 16,000. Okay. Yeah, it's, uh, so what, what was that book again that, that describes it in more detail? It's called An American Genocide. Wonderful. Um, would you recommend that to the audience if they wanted to know more? It is very, very detailed. It is, it is an academic text. Yeah. Uh, it is a very intense academic text. Okay, no problem. So I think a lot of the folks out there would be down for something like that. Um, okay, so something else I'm curious about as I was reading about the Spanish mission um, was the effort to root out witchcraft. Does does that seem... Um, does that seem right? Does that, does that sound accurate to you? The aim of the mission system was largely around, from the religious side of it, civilizing, in their words, the, the indigenous peoples. So part of that meant having to learn Spanish Catholic ceremony. And so some scholars have talked about the ways in which these ceremonies were intelligible through the lens of the native people. There's also some interesting evidence around what kinds of things continued on even into the mission period. So there's this famous image of dancers at Mission San Jose and they are in regalia in what appears to be some kind of cultural or ceremonial dance. So this is interesting because on the one hand, we know that ceremonies and indigenous practices were not something that the Spanish wanted. On the other hand, it seems like there were some things that were permissible at certain times. So we have to kind of ask ourselves, what really went down in these missions. It's so much more complicated than what the mainstream tells us because native people were making all kinds of choices, including several revolts that happened in these missions, right? They were not just passively entering into these spaces. Mm. Do any like really stand out examples of that linger for you, like a way that any pushback was made? I think that one of the, there are two things. Okay. I'm looking at um, Mission Dolores here in San Francisco. And I'm thinking about the fact that the curator involved in interpretation is a descendant of native people who were baptized at that mission. And when he he invited me to join him for a tour, and one of the first things he said to the, the folks in the old mission church was, this is not a Spanish mission. This is an Indian mission built by Indians. He told us to look to the ceiling, which is painted in a traditional California Indian basket weave pattern. Years ago, they somehow had the idea to look at the wall behind the main altar. And behind that altar, they found this fresco of all of these images and symbols that were both Spanish Catholic and indigenous. Mm. So it really brings up this question of what were the folks What were the native folks that entered into these spaces? What were they thinking? What what ways were they able to maintain cultural traditions and knowledge even while under the eyes of 
the priests. And we see some of this in the 1920s when this man, well, several, several anthropologists went to communities of folks that were missionized. And in the 1920s, most famously, John Peabody Harrington went to the area where descendants of Mission San Jose, Mission San Juan Batista, and Mission San Carlos lived and interviewed them and created like thousands of pages of ethnographic linguistic material. And they talk about traditional stories and plant knowledge and ceremonial knowledge and place names. And those documents that they contributed to have become central to the ways that contemporary Ohlone communities are now reviving cultural traditions. Mm, that's so interesting. I love that. Um, you know, and I was, as I was reading through your work as well, I noticed that there is an effort, it seems often, to uh, defend Sarah, defend the mission system, um, you know, to, to keep it reframed in a certain way. I'm wondering what some of the most commonly cited defenses are uh, in favor of Sarah and the mission system um, that, that defenders and apologists tend to make, and then maybe what the conversation is like in response to those defenses. For Catholics, Junipero Serra is a officially canonized, recognized saint. His defenders point to the fact that he brought the gospel to indigenous peoples. They talk about how he actively was a friend and defender of native peoples, pointing to the fact that he spoke out against the death penalty for native peoples involved in the 1775 revolt at Mission San Diego. They point to the fact that he tried to prevent soldiers from harming native people. And so one of the ways that that looks is ensuring that the presidios, the military bases were built away from the missions. And for others, he was the figure that was responsible for massive death and cultural destruction of native California people. And there's often questions about, well, was this just a byproduct? Was it like an unfortunate thing that happened? And that argument really needs to also take into account that the California mission system built on a mission system that was already in existence. And what happened in those earlier missions, Native people went into the missions, they got sick and they died. Mm. Native people went into those missions and they revolted. So it's not as if Sera and other Spaniards entered into the space and were like, oh wow, we had no idea. How did this happen? So today, folks are responding to that. They're responding to death, destruction, sexual violence by priests and by soldiers, the loss of cultural knowledge because these cultures passed knowledge on through oral traditions, they couldn't burn the books. But when people died, we lost that knowledge. And mm. when we look at some of the writings, there are some anthropologists and some historians that say, we will never know the extent of blank, for example, because, because of what happened. That was such a radical rupture. So folks are responding to the impacts of that rupture. There are a whole spectrum within California native communities around this issue. And so I just wanna be really clear that there are California Indian folks who are descendants from these missions that have a whole spectrum of perspective. There are folks that were adamantly against the canonization and there were also native people who were part of the campaign to have Junipero Serra canonized. So I think that's it's just a nuance that's really important. 
I'm curious about the impact of the Mexican American war and how that may have changed the the situation um, on the ground in relation to the mission system. Did that have any impact at all? Yes. So with the end of the Mexican American war and the signing of the treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, California becomes part of the United States. Actually, let's take a step back. So we have the mission system and then Mexico gets or achieves independence from Spain. So this means that the lands around the missions then become part of Mexican territory, right? This also means that the missions formally end in a process that's often called secularization. Mm. So what this means for native people is that they largely remain landless. Part of the goal of the missions, at least on paper, was that they would transform native people into Spanish Catholic subjects and then land would be reverted to them. For the most part, that did not happen after the missions ended. And so native people in California were essentially landless in their own territory. And then the next wave that happens is when California becomes part of the United States as a result of the Mexican-American War and the signing of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo in 1848. And this does not actually help California Indian people. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, it actually makes things worse. The first governor, Peter Burnett, talked about a war of extermination of California Indian people. Mm. So most people don't know anything about this, have never heard about this. And what I always tell people is none of this is secret. It is very clearly documented following the, these wars of extermination, we also have the signing of treaties, which is the thing that most people have no idea about. There were treaties in California. There were 18 treaties that were signed. However, those treaties were never ratified. So I am in San Francisco on treaty, unratified treaty territory. Mm. Interesting. You know, and a, a lot of, I have a lot of friends across Canada and I have a lot of friends in Winnipeg and on a lot of their like Twitter bios and things like that, instead of saying Winnipeg, Manitoba, it will say treaty one territory. And I, I love the idea of recognizing specifically uh, what territory you, you happen to be on at any given time and recognizing the power of the history under on, on the ground on what you walk every day. You know, it's just such a way that ties you so much more importantly to the land, but also um, is, you know, a recognition of the atrocity that took place uh, before you were there and just paying some sort of attention and respect to that, I think is, is important. Does that make sense? It does. And I would push that even further in a lot of the conversations that Native leaders are having here around land acknowledgements, a lot of the sentiment is, yes, these are great. Let's recognize the history of this place. Let's recognize the atrocity. And let's also recognize survival. Mm. And then let's also recognize that this history involves all of us. If we are living here, we are part of that history. So then, how do we move from acknowledgement to what does respectful relationship look like? Mm. What, what responsibilities do we have if we are living in someone's homeland? Mm -hmm. I'm thinking of Karina Gould, who is an activist here in the Bay Area. She's the spokesperson for the Confederated Villages of Lashan. And she always says, we want to be good hosts, but we need good guests. Mm. So, so this is part of, I think, 
what can happen as we have these conversations. Definitely. And I know that these, these conversations are still ongoing. I know that there was like a, a recent apology made by Governor Gavin Newsom around something. Can you talk a little bit about how this is still ongoing in the conversation and the political dialogue of California? Yes. So Governor Newsom issued a formal apology and the communities that I am connected to are now interested in in what ways will that apology lead to systemic changes for their people? So one of those issues is around federal acknowledgement. None of the Ohlone tribes have federal recognition status. And in terms of religion, this is really important because it also means that they don't always have the political power to protect their religious places. Mm. And I talk about this with my students. I actually mentioned this yesterday in class. If we think about religious freedom as the central piece and what we understand American government to be, if you can't have access to your sacred places, can you actually have religious freedom? Mm. Interesting. Um, you know, Abel, there's something else that you have written about a lot in the Bay Area. And that is the indigenous history of the neighborhood that is so well known as the Castro neighborhood. And I found this article that you did about the Castro and the indigenous history of that of that area to be so interesting. Um, can you tell us a little bit about, about that work as well that you focus on within the Castro? As I mentioned, a lot of my interest in these issues is about how we understand our relationship to these histories. We are always interconnected and I'm interested in how can we find that thread that connects us to these histories. And so for me, as a queer person, I was very moved when I read this piece by Deborah Miranda called Gendercide in Spanish California. And it was all about the ways in which Spanish Catholic colonization was also intimately involved in the management of indigenous gender and sexuality. And so what does it mean that very close to me, there was this mission that was so deeply involved in the management of queer gender and sexuality. And at the same time, 100, 150 years later, 200 years later, it is seen as this like queer Mecca what does that mean? I remember going to the Dyke Arch, which is one of the events that happens uh, during Pride Weekend in June, and sitting at Dolores Park and thinking about what does it mean that I'm at Dolores Park, which is named after Mission Dolores, that just several hundred feet away, indigenous queer people, trans people, indigenous women experience terror at these sites. And so I'm interested in then how can we think about our relationship to these histories? Mm. That has uh, got to, you know, wreak some turmoil in the mind, knowing the immense history of the area. Does that make sense? I mean, it's got to be like, there, like a, a dichotomy going on as well. And I would say, at least for me, the goal is not to read any of this history and then remain in this place of either sadness or shame, mm -hmm. because that actually doesn't help anybody. Right. I'm interested in how can we understand that history so that we can collectively create something different. Mm. And what I tell my students is this kind of violence is not inevitable we can create something different, but we can't get to that place until we actually understand how we got to where we were, where we are. That's such an awesome life lesson for those students. That's so concisely said. And I'm sure that, that they walk away from their classroom experience thinking that, I hope for a long period of time. Um, you know, something else you mentioned earlier jumps out about the fact that there was not as much written down. So a lot of things are just simply unable to be known. I'm curious if you, have any um, 
you know, things you can talk about with your, your research about like archival work or interviews or primary sources or traveling, like how do you get at information which might be lost entirely? Like how do you go about doing this work? I am primarily an, an ethnographer and this other piece that emerged as I was doing research was that I really need to look at archaeological reports. Mm, cool. So I wrote a piece about the West Berkeley Shell Mound, which is the oldest or among the oldest archaeological sites in the Bay Area. Uh, shell mounds were burial sites, village sites, and the West Berkeley Shell Mound is dated to over 4,000 years old. And the current issue right now is that the person who owns, there's, it's built, the West Berkeley Shell Mound is developed upon like many other sacred sites in the Bay Area. And this one area of a parking lot in West Berkeley is the only area that is not built upon. So it's a parking lot. And to understand the history of that place meant having to read through the archeological reports of excavation that happened in that area. So that gets us to look at other avenues of knowledge beyond what was written down. It's super important to think about who was writing these anthropological texts within California, this archeologist or this anthropologist named Alfred Kroeber is infamous. He wrote this book in 1925 called The Handbook of the Indians of California. And he wrote that Ohlone people were extinct mm -hmm. so far as all practical purposes were concerned. And then you look at some of the oral histories, they are very much alive. The other piece is around when trying to find cultural continuity to particular places or particular ceremonies that happen at those places, we can look at the archeological records that point to various fragments, ceremonial objects that then expand what some of these earlier anthropologists were saying. Mm. Okay, cool. You know, before we wrap up, uh, there is, I know something else that is, you know, been on your mind recently. And that's the COVID-19 pandemic that we're currently in, you know, the 12th or 13th month living through, surviving, doing our best. Um, but I'd be remiss if we didn't speak about your work in what we are dealing with as far as COVID-19 and how your work is addressing this. Um, you have a piece for The Revealer titled Tribal and Religious Organizations Respond to COVID-19 Through Mutual Aid and Traditional Teachings. And I think that you explained to me that this piece was done with the Center for the Study of Religion in the City, directed by Dr. Harold Morales, and involving you, Kareem Amin, Dr. Kayla Wheeler, and others. I'm wondering what your project involved and what your focus was with that, and maybe some of your major findings. So firstly, the aim was to distribute funds to community organizations and community partners in their efforts to respond to the pandemic. And the other part was about documenting their responses, their efforts as a way of then creating a model for other people to survive this pandemic and future crises. And it may not be surprising that different groups were impacted in different ways. So for example, we interviewed the uh, Humunya Tribal Foundation of the Amamutsin Tribal Band. And the Amamutsin is one of the tribes within what's now called the Lonely Territory. And as an indigenous tribe, they were not able to continue practicing ceremonies the way that they are used to because that involves going to particular places and being around a group of people can't really do that during COVID. You can't do that on Zoom either. Mm -hmm. Then there were other groups like Jews United for Justice that were involved in digital organizing anyway, 
And so they were able to continue for the most part, things that they were doing, but then shining light on the ways that their partner organizations and communities have been impacted by the virus. The most interesting thing for me was really seeing how traditional values and cultural teachings are active in these responses. So for example, for Amamutsin, even though they cannot do their ceremonies the way that they're used to, they still, even in this socially distant and digital way, are able to continue to protect this place, Eurostock, which is one of their most sacred places. And it's currently being threatened by a sand and gravel mine. And so they did a lot of digital activism, social media activism, and a youth, a socially distant youth walk to the gates of Eurostock to bring visibility. The Segorite Land Trust, which is an urban indigenous woman-led land trust, does a lot of community gatherings pre-COVID and instead had to shift their programming to a food distribution service, which is really a outcome of this indigenous value of care for community. We interviewed another group called the Black Church Food Security Network, which is all about connecting black farmers to black church communities to create a sustainable community-based food system. And one of the things that they did is they created a Black church supported agriculture program, so like a CSA. And they also did a lot of work around encouraging Black churches to learn food preservation and gardening and uh, created a seed bank that then they distributed to different partner churches. And all of this was inspired by the work of Black church leaders and Black civil rights leaders. So mm -hmm. there's a way in which these religious values still continue in a new way, even in the wake of this virus. Mm, interesting. Well, Abel, we've been chatting for, for ages now uh, about so many fantastic topics. And all of these things are like sort of like a nugget in my mind about topics that I need to continue to follow. And in that vein, following your work, can you maybe tell me a little bit about what your, some of your plans are for maybe the next couple of years within your own scholarship? The goal on the one hand is to certainly continue to finish this dissertation project and transform it into a monograph and do that in partnership and relationship with the communities that I've talked to as well as continue to do work around native responses to the missions and documenting strategies that people are using to defend their religious and cultural places. Mm. Do you have any organizations or activist groups that you would recommend any listeners check out if they want to know a little bit more about what's going on in the Bay Area in California? Absolutely. So I mentioned the West Berkeley Shell Mound, and if folks are interested, they can go to shellmound.org to learn about that movement. There is also the movement to protect Eurostock, which I mentioned, by led by the Amamutsin Tribal Band, and folks can go to protecteurostock.org, and Eurostock is spelled J-U-R-I-S-T-A-C. Uh, and Eurostock means uh, the place of the big head. And these were uh, ceremonial dances for renewal. Wonderful. Well, Abel, this has been a wonderful and wide ranging conversation. I'm grateful to you for your time and your energy and all the scholarship that you've been putting out recently. It's It was just so readable and I just was consuming it voraciously in preparation for our conversation. So it's so nice to see some more context um, behind the work to chat with you today. Can you tell people where they can find you personally if they want to follow you and know more about your work in the coming months and years? You can follow me on Twitter 
And my username is Jaratura, G-J-A-R-A-T-U-R-A. Wonderful. Well, Abel Gomez, this has been a fabulous conversation. Thank you so much for coming on Classical Ideas. It's been a real pleasure. Thanks so much for chatting with me. Classical Ideas is produced by me, Greg Soden. Music on Classical Ideas is composed and performed by Derek Strybig. Support for this episode of Classical Ideas was provided by Sacred Rights, a Henry Luce Foundation project. Explore the work of Sacred Rights at sacred-rights.org.